This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 438 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Our sponsors this week are Horselovers.com and the Fairfield Inn North in Lexington, Kentucky. Today, we have an author on for you, Sharon Smith. She did a book about Stonewall Jackson's Little Sorrel. And we also are going to be talking to Biz Stam, who's going to review the Mountain Horse Ladies Sovereign Field Boots, all coming up on today's show. Welcome to the Stable Scoop, with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the Stable, it's every week. They bring you the news through hail or high water, while using their tails as their own fly swatters. Sit on down and laugh till your poop calls. It's time again for Stable School. Stable School. Stable School. Stable School. I'm Glenn the Geek. And I'm Helena B. And you're listening to the Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. Well, it's good to talk to you again, Helena. I haven't talked to you all holiday. I know. you were. Uh, there was radio silence coming out of Horse Radio Network for a couple of days. I, I got a little nervous, honestly. Well, we successfully did a 10-day vacation, and I really tuned out. I really didn't do any work at all. <laughs> and that has to be the first time in 30 years. No wonder you're in such a cheerful mood I today. Know. I I really am feeling refreshed. You know, but it, but that makes it harder though when you actually come back after that long a break where you really haven't done anything and then you look at everything that has to be done and you go, I don't want to get out of bed this morning. <laughs> That's the worst part about holidays is the the rush to get everything ready before you go away and then the mad dash to get it to catch up. So you're like, what have the whole and especially around Christmas time, you think the whole world shuts down for a couple of days. But somehow there's this work that sneaks into your your list, your to-do list. Like, what happened while I was gone? Who threw stuff in my to-do <laughs> right. bucket? Fortunately, I didn't get a lot of emails. That's one nice thing about the holidays in the job we have is you don't hear from a lot of people because they're not thinking about you either. Right. So that works out kind of well. And we did... <laughs> we did we did. Uh, we actually went home to Pennsylvania for the first time for the holidays in like ten years. And yeah, I posted a picture on on the horse or on the uh, horses in the morning and my page today of the most special gift ever. Uh, I don't know if you saw the picture of the Afghan, but uh, I did. You sent me a text on Christmas Day. I posted <laughs> you were another so excited. picture today that's a little bit better than the one I sent you. It was uh, amazing. I mean, it took her six months as a Jennifer stepmom, Alita. And she had asked for a logo, and I didn't know why. Last year, sometime, she asked for a logo, and she's been working on this. We thought maybe she, we knew she, she, uh, you know, quilted and did. We also knew that you know she did Afghans and stuff. She knitted, and uh, but we we were expecting a placemat. <laughs> this thing is about six foot wide and about six foot tall full size blanket that she uh, that she did an Afghan of. And it, it must have 10,000, 20,000 stitches in it. I mean, it is oh my huge. Goodness. You said it took her how long? Six, Six months, months to? It took her three lay? weeks to lay it out. Ugh. You know, on the, I guess they use graph paper. Uh, and it took her three weeks to lay it out. I, it's just incredible. And it was beautiful. So it's, it's, ob it's obviously the most special gift we've probably ever gotten because of all the work that went into it. Yeah. And, Aww, and really what a cool. love. Yep. Really cool. And, and of course, the, you know, the logo looks really good on it. <laughs> Because the Horse Radio Network logo. Can I give a shout out to Sherry uh, from the Orion Group who did our logo all those years ago? That Horse Radio Network logo with little microphone guy. It it pays people, and I'm I'm giving a plug to Helena here too, who does graphic arts. You may pay a little more than you do at Fiverr, but we that logo was worth every penny we paid for it. That's a big deal coming from you because Glenn's was. like the Fiverr king. He's am. like, give me a discount and I'll buy it. <laughs> I am, but it was worth every penny we paid for that logo because, and we paid a little more for it than you normally would. But look at that little microphone guy. We can put that little microphone guy someplace now. Don't need the HRN and everybody knows it's us. It's true. And that it's makes true. a good logo, right? 
I mean, you're the, yeah. you're the art queen. I mean, that... it has to be simple and it has to be memorable. It does not. The, the number one mistake that people make when designing a logo is they put too much detail into it. And our little brains cannot remember all of those details. It just has to be as simple as possible. Well, when we were designing it, I think you were the, were the one that said it. People didn't know us as HRN back then when we had this made. They knew Horse Radio Network. We weren't really going by HRN then. No, but and, you know what? You used it consistently. You used it yeah. everywhere. And once you decided on the logo, you stuck with it. You didn't change well, it. I wanted to put Horse Radio Network at the bottom underneath the HRN and the little horse guy. And you talked me out of that. You said, no, nope. if it's going to become much. branded with HRN, you've got to just let it be. Um, and <laughs> that is the biggest challenge in anything, just letting things be. I know, because you, you, I do. You In logos or whatever, letterhead or what, ads, you want to put everything because you think everything is important. And everything is important, but you, we, we always have to think about what is this thing that I'm creating going to be used for. And a logo is, it's a brand stamp. That's it. Plain and simple. You see a Ford coming down the road. You look at the emblem on the on the hood of that car. You know it's a Ford. You know it's it's just got to be that simple. Ford, I, I get, know, just, but I tell you what, the, the the ones like Honda and Toyota and stuff, I still look at them and go, okay, which one is that again? Because they don't have their because name on changed. it. Yeah, yeah, because they've changed. And they don't have their name on it. It's just the swirls. Uh, but yeah, look at Nike. I mean, yep. <laughs> You look at even any of the networks, uh, NBC, you see the peacock, you know it's NBC. Yeah. 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 Even right. even just a lot of the, the most memorable logos are nothing more than a unique typeface. It's the name of the company or one word in a font and a color. That's it. Nothing else, you know? And well, look at Apple. And it just it's just change. the Apple. They don't even use their name, it's just the Apple. Yeah, it's just a little apple with the bite taken out. You know? it's just, you, you got to. It's, it's again, it's consistency and repetition. Well, there, there is our lesson in uh, in logo <laughs> design for anybody looking at getting a logo. Who do they call, Helena? This wasn't meant to be an ad, but we might as well. Uh, no, well, they can certainly call Sherry at Ryan, or they can go to SparkleAndBoom dot com. Go to SparkleAndBoom.com. dot com. You know her already. That Helena girl, she'll do it. For you. Actually, I have to say that um, one of our dedicated Stable Scoop listeners uh, recently recommended a marketing job to me. It was a a full page print ad for a magazine, which has been so much fun to do. So I'm really excited about that. So you well, guys you, keep listener. it coming. Yes, thank you very much. No I, I love listen. doing the the equestrian ads. When the ad's done and finally approved, we'll share it. But I, I don't want to share that before the client is ready. Well, and you know it is fun because you know we all do other stuff too, uh, and it's but we always have more fun doing horse stuff. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh! Well, that's how I got started, and so it's it's always nice. And then you know when when the recession hit, I had to expand outside of the horse world, which is fine. It makes you money, but you know nowhere. Am I more excited or more immersed in my job than when I'm really trying to articulate a message about horses to the, you know, to the world in general? It's just, it's wonderful. Well, we're going to get to our first guest here in a few minutes. We have Sharon Smith coming on, who's going to talk about a cool new book she did on Stonewall Jackson's Little Sorrel in just a minute. But first, I have to mention that Horselovers.com is having a huge end-of-the-year sale. They have products up to 90% off. They also have brand-name products up to 75% off. You can't keep track of all the sales they're doing right now in a, kind of an overstock sale. And when I looked at it, Weaver Leather, they have 92% off on some of the products from Weaver Leather, including some of their leather goods. So just head on over there. The banner at the top of the page will show all the different sales they have going on. Now is the time, just like if you're buying Christmas stuff, you should do it right after Christmas. Now yeah. is the time to buy stuff about for your horse, whether it's winter or summer or whatever. They have it on sale right now. So I was looking. They had... They had uh, dog stuff, a lot of dog stuff there. They have, they have collars right now marked down from ten dollars to a dollar ninety nine dog collars. They have the leashes marked down for twenty nine dollars to nine dollars. Uh, they just have all kinds of stuff, whether it's bits or or bridles or halters, whatever it is that you're looking for for your horse right now. They have a ton of different bits marked down. 
And that's Western too. So you're, you know, we don't often talk about that, but Weaver Leather obviously does a lot of Western stuff as well. Uh, so they even have sh- sheep halters. Yep, they have sheep halters. Wow! I didn't know you led <laughs> sheep by a halter, but apparently you do. I didn't know. I uh, need to go out and get a sheep just so I can get a sheep halter. They also had yes, something. I've called, always wanted a sheep. They also had something called a pig pipe, a pig pipe. And apparently it's the stick thing that they guide pigs into the show ring. That's a little concerning. I didn't know. You don't beat them with it. You just, they sort of tap them and to get them to go in a direction because, you know, pigs go where they want to go. But yeah, they had pig pipes. I I didn't know. When I was looking around there today, I was amazed at some of the different stuff they have. So go check it out today at horselovers.com. We're going to talk a little bit bit more about horse lovers later in the show because Biz is going to be reviewing a terrific product from them a little bit later. So English or Western, horselovers.com. Sharon B. Smith is a former news reporter and anchor who moved into sports and horse racing journalism at ESPN. She also worked on racing broadcasts for several years on NBC Sports. Since leaving broadcasting, she's written more than half a dozen books, including works on racing, horse care, and training, and the Civil War. So we're going to welcome Sharon to the show today. Hi, Sharon. Hi, everybody, and thanks very much for having me. We were just talking briefly before we started taping this segment, and um, you've actually, so you've written quite a few books, but not all of them were about horses. Most of them were about horses. Uh, Take us back to the very beginning, and how did you get involved with horses? Were you born into a horsey family? Well, sort of. I'm actually from Montana originally, although we, uh, we left there when I was very young because it's cold up there. Um, and, I, you know, it's, horses have been in my life forever. I actually learned to ride very young. I became extremely fond of horse racing when my dad was stationed in England. He was a career Air Force officer. And so I, I just became really fond of racing. I would have stayed there, but my parents made me come home. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had no choice, but I, I thought it was great there because horses were, were and still are very important in England. And so I came back and I uh, got into uh, journalism, ended up at ESPN because I had been working at a TV station in uh, Connecticut. ESPN went on the air and I went up there and was a sports reporter and anchor. And literally one day, one of the producers came into the newsroom and said, we've acquired this series of horse racing broadcasts. Does anybody in the room here like racing or know anything about it? And I, of course, waved my hand and said, yes, yes, I love it. And that's really what started a you know, a career specifically in broadcast, uh, you know, horse racing broadcasting. Because you were the only one in the room that knew anything. <laughs> well, Is it, isn't that, that's the day. That's how you get a project. Yeah, you wave your right. hand and you go, ooh, ooh, me, me. I know about that. <laughs> and they really thought I knew something because one day on Sports Center, it was, it was Kentucky Derby Day, and, um, you know, the, the various people on SportsCenter were, were guessing who was going to win. And I picked Gato Del Sol, who did indeed win at, I think, around 20 to 1. And they thought I was brilliant. But really, the only <laughs> thing I knew is he was the only horse with, with a record at all in the mud. And it was a very muddy day. So I said, oh, yeah, yeah, he's going to win. And he did. <laughs> Which, of course, never happens. As soon as you say that, you, know, yeah. you look like a fool because they never do. But it worked out. So they thought I knew something. And, you know, so it ended up being great fun. Every once in a while, you guess right at the right day at the right time. <laughs> exactly. And you, because it's only every once in a while, I don't actually bet. Although I once wrote a uh, complete idiot's guide to betting on horses, I almost never bet. I know what those guys can do, the <laughs> foolish things a horse can do. <laughs> yeah. So I'm no not going to put my money on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, one of the most frequently used words to describe horses is unpredictable. So why we would gamble on them, I don't know. Exactly, exactly. They don't bet on us. They know something. <laughs> <laughs> I've never so heard did that you line. Get... That's pretty good. I'm going to use that. That's, did you... good. That's two we got from her <laughs> this week. <laughs> okay. So did you just get dumped into this uh, racing slash broadcasting world and had to find your own way? And, and did you have the freedom to do that? Or was there some more organized uh, process? Well, you know, when you get into, I, I actually studied journalism in college, and I got out into the world. I intended to be like a newspaper foreign correspondent, believe it or not. I ended up working at a television station in Texas and got into news that way. And then it was just it was just chance that I happened in Connecticut when ESPN went on the air. Um, they were looking for people. I did like sports. It wasn't as if I hated sports and knew nothing about it. So I went to work there. And, and then the racing was really just chance because they got a, a racing package that needed to be broadcast. And they weren't going to hire any expensive people from outside. It was just <laughs> us, 
<laughs> already on staff, and it, so it worked out well. And then when I when I finished in television, um, I just started doing the books, and I was able to get horse books published because I had a little, you know, a little background. So it worked out well. I'm happy. Well, that's terrific. Now you uh, you've written a number of books on horses. We actually had you on the Horses in the Morning show like four years ago. Uh, and it was for a book you did on Dan Patch, which uh, which was one of the most famous uh, harness horses ever, uh, harness racing horses ever. But then you came, last year came out with a book that kind of went, you went a different route with this one. Tell us about why you went history on this one. Well, I've also always loved history, and um, part of my growing up was in northern Virginia, where all the battlefields are. So I, I had that sort of in the back of my mind. But it really came about because about, let's see, it would have been ninth, about ninth, uh, 2000, I'm trying to think of what year it was, about 2009, I think, just as the Civil War sesquicentennial was getting underway, I did a book, a short book, uh, on Connecticut sites in the Civil War, because I do live in Connecticut. And believe it or not, there were some, even though it was pretty far away from, from the actual battles. And one of the things I came across was a marker in the town of Summers, Connecticut, a little tiny town north uh, in the northern part of the state on the Massachusetts border. Summers has maybe 2,000 people. And on the in front of City Hall, there's a sign says, that said, Summers, Connecticut, the birthplace of Little Sorrel, who was Stone, General Stonewall Jackson's war horse, Jackson, a Confederate. Now, the whole story sounds a little preposterous. How could a horse from Summers you know, become Stonewall Jackson's war horse? So I looked into, into it a little bit. I talked to a town historian and said, now, where did the story come from? And she basically said, well, everybody knows it's true. And I said, uh-oh, but how? <laughs> <Of course>. Wikipedia <laughs> so said <I> so. <laughs> right. Everybody knows it's true. Therefore, it's true. That Gee, that sounds like fake news, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. No. Um, <laughs> At any rate, um, so I looked into it a little bit, could not pin it down. It just seemed so unlikely, did not put it into that book on Connecticut sites in the Civil War. But a couple of years later, I, was, I, you know, I, I came across the story again and it occurred to me, that is really an interesting story. Could it be true? And if it was, how did that horse you know, get to where he was? And the research uh, showed me a, a fascinating little horse. He was tiny, probably less than 15 hands. And can you imagine a Confederate general war horse of, let's say, 14-3? It seems, you know, totally improbable. Um, so I, I got into the story that way. turned out he was an extremely famous horse throughout the South, second only to Traveler, you know, uh, Robert E. Lee's famous horse. Yeah. And at some point in his life was even more famous than Traveler because he was a, a little character. You know, he did some interesting things, and he survived. He lived to 36, and um, hard to believe wow. he was in a dozen battles and still lived to 36. Now tell us, so re- was, remind us about Stonewall Jackson a little bit. For those of us that it was, a well, for me, it was a long time ago from, you know, high school <laughs> history. For, so. for me, too. Yeah. <laughs> Stonewall Jackson was one of the most famous soldiers in American history, but for some kind of unusual reasons. He's sort of identified as a, a military genius who in his own life and in other ways was, uh, you know, best described as peculiar. Um, he was a religious fanatic. He thought, certainly thought God was on his side. Now, of course, a lot of soldiers at that time were convinced that God was on their side, and, uh, you know, they even people on different sides believed that. Jackson was a... Um, an infantry general who who was most famous probably for what was called the Shenandoah Valley Campaign, where he um, sort of ran his, his troops around um, staying ahead of the Union forces. Um, general Lincoln was terrified that they were going to come up to Washington and take Washington. This was in the spring of 1862. It was relatively early in the war. Um, he uh, was second only to Robert E. Lee in his importance to the Confederacy, but then in, in May of, of 1863 at the Battle of Chancellorsville, which he generally is conceded won by a remarkable flank march hiding from the, the Federals coming around to the side of them um, and, and striking them there. That battle was won, but he unfortunately was shot by his own men and died a week later. The interesting thing about that whole thing is one, and while the, hor- the horse was there, Little Sorrel was carrying him when it happened, is that throughout the war I discovered, throughout their war, which lasted for two years before Jackson was wounded, uh, Jackson repeatedly risked himself. He he felt he had to see for himself what was going on. So he'd go up on a high ground and 
overlook uh, the Union forces below within, you know, certainly within cannon range and within rifle range sometimes as well. And he was right there on his horse. Now, um, Jackson was a Presbyterian who do, did believe in predestination. You know, if it was his time, it was going to be his time. I don't think poor little Sorrel was a Presbyterian, <laughs> but he was risked right along with, with his master, but little Sorrel did survive. Um, so, you know, I ended up having sort of mixed feelings about Jackson. I think he was a military genius because he could do amazing things with small forces, but he, he took terrible risks with his own life and with that of his poor horse. Um, mm. Jackson lost out at the Battle of Chancellorsville. The little horse did survive. So, you know, I guess little Sorrel survived in the end. Don't give me the ending. I don't want to hear the no, ending. No, no, no. Yeah, don't <laughs> yeah. give away the end. Now, didn't Stonewall Jackson get the name? Wasn't it the battle? Was it Bull Run? Yes, it yeah. was first Bull Run or first Manassas. There's two two names for it. Um, you know, for for a variety of reasons, mainly because his troops stood stood firm uh, while the other Confederate troops were falling, uh, and that sort of turned the tide, and the Confederates won that battle. Now, interestingly enough. He was not on Little Sorrel in that battle. He uh, he had acquired the horse a, a couple of months earlier, taken him off a freight train uh, that had been traveling between Ohio and uh, Baltimore. Basically, they, the Confederates had confiscated the train that included a handful of horses and some beef cattle. And he kept Little Sorrel for supposedly that he was going to give him to his, his wife. Because um, he was a shrimpy little horse and a pacing horse, besides totally unsuitable. Oh, he for was warriors. a pacer. He was a pacer, which oh. becomes kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> but he kept him. Because okay, he that a, sight. When you think about it, though, and... Sharon, when you think about the sight of a general coming up on a pacer, we'd all laugh nowadays. It'd be well, kind of funny. What, <laughs> and you know what they laughed then? And oh, you look at the memoirs, and I looked at a ton of, ton of memoirs, and they thought he looked hilarious. <laughs> now he was—he got the reputation as a terrible rider. The horse is a terrible horse. Um, but reading the descriptions of him as a rider, you know, why they thought he was terrible is he rode way too short and he leaned forward, which if we saw him now would be a perfectly normal forward seat, you know, right. riding. He, right. he would be perfectly respectable. But then in those days, especially in the military, they sat in, in I think they call it, they would call it a rocking chair. You know, they'd lean way back, even beyond what a saddle seat rider would, would do today. And they would have their feet shoved forward, um, we would think that would be a terrible rider if we saw that today. So I'm not sure Jackson was a terrible rider. He was just different. And if you look at, at Little Sorrel, the one photograph of him from wartime, there's plenty of, of old age photographs, but the one from wartime shows a horse that isn't a terrible little horse at all. He had the reputation of being it. He's a nice looking, small, compact pacing horse with high withers, uh, a slopey croup, which they, you know, was not acceptable <laughs> to the thoroughbred loving Southern gentleman. Um, so he was a good horse. His rider was probably a good rider. They just looked different. They just looked peculiar. You know, it's funny as we just watched, finally got to watch over the weekend, Harry and Snowman. And uh -huh. the movie, and boy, when you watch the old footage of the riding, even back in the 1950s, it, it hadn't changed much from the Civil War to the 50s, because, yeah. you know, yeah. the, you watch them riding and jumping these big jumps in the positions they were in, it was like, oh my God, <laughs> I don't well, know how I'll they stayed you, in the saddle. <laughs> back in the, you know, Jackson did go to West Point, and fortunately, his riding instructor at West Point um, published a book at about the same time with you know, directions on how you should sit and what you should do with your stirrups and so on. So we know exactly how he was trained and how the um, how how the other soldiers would ride. Now, Jackson ignored that training, obviously, but they rode so far back. And in fact, when they jumped, they were taught to jump a little. They called it leaping, but it was jumping. They were taught to lean completely back, almost laying back on the, you know, the, the rear end of the horse with the feet far forward. I mean, it just seems it's totally improbable to us today, but that's how they were taught. You see the old fox hunting pictures and paintings. That's the way they are. Right, exactly. right Helena? Right. They're all just uh, lean totally back. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's whatever horse. keeps you on the horse, honestly. <laughs> and and, and it's know, not pretty sometimes, but it's right. effective. <laughs> that's another thing about Stonewall Jackson. Um, even though his reputation among his contemporaries was as a bad rider, I couldn't find one reference to him having fallen off the horse. And even Robert E. Lee, you know, the, the, the great hero, was thrown from Traveler a number of times. So, you know, 
it's whatever keeps you on and whatever's effective. And Jackson was effective and the little horse was certainly effective as well. That well, brings up an, in, an interesting question is going through in your research, how did you find such detailed information about uh, Jackson's relationship with his horse? And um, I mean, this is, this is really going into detail. Where did you start with your research? Well, what I did was look at all the memoirs that I could find. Now, Jackson was, was an important figure even then. So everybody wrote their memoirs and mentioned him if they saw him. So I found every single one that I possibly could and looked for references to, to him and the horse. And there's a lot of them. Um, most of them, most of them, uh, you know, they describe him and most of them were negative, except I did find one man who obviously knew horses better. And, and rather than saying he had a funny shambling gait, he knew that, that Little Sorrel was a pacer, and he describes that he could pace really fast, about 240 for the mile, and that was really fast in those days. The record was in the 220s. The world record for a pacing mile was in the 220s, so 240 could have could have made him a racehorse, maybe not quite enough to win, and that's probably how he got on that stock train you know, to be shipped off to, to be a war horse or to be used in the war. Um, but so he, you know... You could find, I was able to find quite a bit about him. Some of it was contradictory. Like at the time Jackson was, was wounded at Chancellorsville, there are several different stories about what happened to the horse. So I looked at them all, and I've concluded well, what I believe is true, that he was never out of Confederate hands. But there was uh, were a couple of stories that he escaped into the Union line, sort of repatriated himself, you could say. <laughs> um, and, uh, and finally, and, and then showed up again uh, by some miracle among the Confederates, but I, I, I'm convinced he was never out of Confederate hands. He was just going wherever the food, wherever they were going to feed him, he was going. Oh, <laughs> He's like everybody else's horse. He wants exactly to take himself right. for a little All grace. care about his food. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this, uh, one of the things that he was, that was so valuable about this little horse was that he didn't have to eat all that much. And, of course, after the first year or so, the Confederate Army had a terrible time feeding the soldiers, much less the horses. Uh, but he managed with just a, a small amount of food, and he, you know, and then got really fat when he had some good grass. <laughs> but he, he was an amazing, one of the most remarkable war horses in history because he was totally unsuitable to be a war horse, and yet he was. Uh, I can't wait to read this book now. Yeah, I, mean, I know, me too. <laughs> I love well, history books. Yeah. You know, one interesting thing I did find out if you like, if you Google uh, Jackson's Little Sorrel, you'll find a lot of references to him as having been a Morgan. Now, he was foaled about 1850, which means, you know, there was no breed of Morgans. There was just a line of horses descended from, presumably, from Justin Morgan, the horse in Vermont. I do not believe he was a Morgan, and if he had any Morgan blood, it was very small amount. I, I believe he was a, well, he probably would not have been a full-blooded, but a, a large percentage of Narragansett Pacer. Do you know what those are? Oh, yeah. Yes, we did that. a whole episode on them. Yeah. You did? Well, I'll tell you. Look at the photo of Little Sorrel taken in 1863, and then read some of the early descriptions of McSparron and some of the others of the Pacer, and you'll swear you're talking about the same horse. The size, the speed of pacing, the color, the slightly oversized head, the uh, high withers, uh, the fact that he could go on forever without uh, you know, needing much food and without tiring, survived the winter campaigns way better than other horses. And if indeed he was from Summers, Connecticut, and I now think there's about an 80% chance that he was, and this was a very long process of, of reaching that point, that was the, the sort of the epicenter of where the last full-blooded Narragansett Pacers stood at stud. So, um, you know, it all fits together. Can't quite prove it, but <laughs> but it came close. You know, now I got to go back and listen to that episode, Glenn. And they yeah. were all riding. Oh, got... A lot of the gentlemen of the day back in back in uh, Virginia and that kind of it, were were all riding gated horses anyway. I mean, the, the, a lot of them rode gated horses. Well, yes, but pacing gated horses were not unknown. I'll tell you one of the reasons is that in the 18th century. Um, some of the gentlemen imported a lot of Narragansett Pacers from Connecticut and Rhode Island because they were such good, you know, riding horses to ride over their acreage. Um, pacing horses, uh, racing pacing horses today are, you know, very difficult right. to ride. Right. Um, I had one for, I never was comfortable riding her and she really didn't want to trot. So that's a whole other story. Expensive pasture decoration. She turned out to be. <laughs> but yeah. at any rate, pacing horses then were, were, um, were designed, you know, bred to be comfortable under saddle. So it was 
they, they they were imported into Virginia, and that that probably is why you know where Tennessee walking horses came from. Although you'd have to really do a DNA analysis to figure out exactly. But yeah, pacing horses or gated horses weren't unknown. But by the time of the Civil War, they were much more rare, and so most of the officers rode horses that trotted. You know, thoroughbred type horses that right. trotted. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Well, we we Very don't want cool. to give away too much more because we want people to read the book. So, where do they go to find it? Well, it's um, it's of course on Amazon. It's on BarnesandNoble dot com. A lot of bookstores have it. Probably mostly in the South because that's after all where Confederate generals are yeah. <laughs> more important. <laughs> right. Um, but sure, you can find it in a lot of places. I was surprised that it ended up in the Military History Book Club. But, hey, it is military history, I guess. <laughs> They're probably studying it in Carlisle. They're at the Army War College. Well, hopefully they have a copy because there's <laughs> stuff that have, has not been printed anywhere else about Stonewall Jackson um, related to his writing. You know, for for example, everybody accepts that he was a bad writer with a peculiar writing style, but I am convinced he got that style from... Uh, years a year he spent in Mexico City after the Mexican you know the Mexican War uh, where they were occupying Mexico City and he really was impressed by the um, the rich Mexican Spanish horsemen who who uh, you know trotted up and down the Paseo there with their standard Spanish seat which was the old Hineta style which is uh, you know forward seat short stirrups I think that's where he got it from. I think there's another book in your future. <laughs> well, I don't think so. <laughs> there are some, actually some good books on the development of, of Western horsemanship and where the um, you know the conquistadors' riding style fit in. There, are, I found some really good books on the subject. So they don't need another of those. <laughs> well, I think it's terrific. We love history books, and I know our audience does too. Check them out. It's uh, Stonewall Jackson's Little Sorrel, and it's Sharon B. Smith. And, and uh, I was actually on Amazon, and we'll put a link to that in our show notes as well. All your books are on there. You have a page, and uh, all the books are listed there. So if you want to check out some of her other books, if you want to read about Dan Patch, you can do that as well, uh, and, and all the other things that you've written about. This has been a lot of fun. Let's not wait for you years again, okay? Well, actually, I just turned in another one, uh, but it's really, I'm just, ed- I edited a bunch of um, of classic horse stories, you know, out of copyright horse stories and wrote the introductions, and that turned oh, cool. out to be very interesting. Yeah, because, you know, both short stories and horses were more important in the 19th and early 20th century, so there's some really good stories out there that people have sort of forgotten about. Well, let us know when so that comes out. that'll be out probably this okay. next summer. <laughs> yeah, let us know. Yeah, I certainly will. All right. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks, right, Sharon. Guys, this was fun. What a Bye-bye. pleasure. The Horse Radio Network is excited to announce a new partnership with the Fairfield Inn North by Marriott in Lexington, Kentucky for Road to the Horse and Rolex. The Fairfield Inn North is right off Newtown Pike and Route 64 near the Cracker Barrel and only 10 minutes from the horse park the back way, you know, the low traffic way. The Fairfield Inn North has spacious rooms that are being completely renovated now and will be ready in time for Road to the Horse. Plus, the Fairfield Inn North offers complimentary breakfast, a free Wi-Fi throughout the hotel, a huge free parking lot, a business center, indoor swimming pool and jacuzzi, outdoor patio with grill, a laundry facility, and much more. The Cracker Barrel is located right next door, and there are four other dining options available for breakfast, lunch, and dinner right around the corner. Just for listeners of Horse Radio Network, we have negotiated some great rates for you for Road to the Horse and Rolex. For Road to the Horse, we have the rate down from $160 to $120. If you're going to Rolex, we have the rate down to $199 from $260. There's a very limited number of rooms available at these rates, so call in your reservations as soon as possible. Search for Fairfield Inn North in Lexington, Kentucky. It's the one on Hackney Place. You must call it your reservation and ask for the Road to the Horse or the Rolex Early Bird Special. So that's the Road to the Horse or Rolex Early Bird Special. Search for Fairfield Inn North by Marriott.
Well, now coming up for our Tack and Habit segment, brought to you by Horselovers.com, is a friend of the show and an auditor. Biz Stam is here. Hi, Biz. Hi, Glenn. How are you doing? Hi, Helena. Hello. It's good to have you. And and everybody will know you because you had the most popular song again at Radio Thon <laughs> this year. Uh, no, the auditors could not stop talking about how how I, you definitely got the vote for the most popular song submitted. And there were there were what a hundred of them. There were a lot this year. Uh, and you, you did the Jewish song. She always does the uh, Hanukkah Jewish song for us every year. So uh, thanks for doing that. And thanks for being so good at it. No problem. I can, you know, proudly say that my lack of shame is paying off. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Biz, you, you know, we're continuing here with products that Horse Lovers was kind enough to send out to everybody for review to the auditors last year. We have a few more to go. And you, <clears throat> I think you got the most expensive one that was sent out, to be honest. <laughs> you got yeah, lucky. Yeah, I got very lucky. Very lucky. You got the just mountain, in time. mountain Horse Lady Sovereign Field Boot, and uh, this is a tall boot. Tell us about it. All right. So I kind of have a little bullet list of uh, different points that I would like to go over for the boot. So first off, in terms of fit, I feel like they're very true to size. So in terms of calf size, I'm right in between um, a standard calf and a slim. And so unless I get a custom there's nothing that's going to fit me exactly. And so I got the standard cap and it was slightly loose, but it still looks really good and it conforms nicely to my calf. And the, the footbed also seems very true to size. And I think that's, you know, an important feature when buying boots, especially if you're going to order them online is to know how they're going to fit. Um, and so I thought they were good in that sense. Um, in terms of comfort, the insoles are really comfortable. They're a little soft, but still plenty of support and really good arch support. And the uppers are made out of really soft leather, and they pretty much require no breaking in. Um, and they, they're lined also with the, the calf leather lining, which I really like. So mm -hmm. one thing I also noticed in terms of comfort is I'm always a little hesitant to get zip boots that have the zipper in the back instead of the side because they when I first get them, always seem to rub on my Achilles tendon area. And these ones have a really awesome little leather cover that protects your ankle from the zipper. So you don't get any blisters or anything like that in over your Achilles tendon when you're breaking in the boots. And that is Ooh, something I really, really appreciate. That was one of the biggest complaints when we, we had our tack business when these zip boots came out. And by the way, as the yeah. person who had to try boots on, on, females that would come in every and it was all females that would come in every yep. time i had to try and get them on and take them off i was the one working up a sweat when zip boots came yes. out i just jumped for joy but the problem they yep. had was everybody was getting blisters on their on their ankles you know on the back yeah and it was yes. a problem yeah yeah definitely and so that was something i loved is i never got blisters um on around my ankle from these which is a big deal to me since i you know i run a lot and the blister is right where you're, you're running to also run, rub. So that was a huge deal for me. And I, I loved them for that. Helena, and when so, she says she runs a lot, she's being very <laughs> modest. Uh, ah, she's a runner. You actually In addition do, to an equestrian, she's a runner. You do serious runs, don't you, Biz? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a distance trail running junkie. So, yeah. Like how <laughs> Pretty long? Pretty much anything. So my next race will be a 25K that I'm doing um, an all trail um, out in, around the lake in Oregon. Um, so anywhere from, you know, I won't really do anything shorter than a 15K. So a 15K and my goal next year is to do a 50K. So Okay, that really wow. makes me feel fat and lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it sounds like fun. I like the idea of trail running instead of just road yeah. running. Can yeah, really I really really like the trail running it's a lot what do you more wear, you know, you need... what do you wear on your feet when you do trail runs um different trail shoes um brooks has really good trail shoes montreal has really good trail shoes but out in oregon it gets so muddy you want something with good traction what? so that what, what's that's different a... about that running sh here we are we're supposed to be talking about boots. i know sorry about <laughs> horse we'll get back to you because well, um, we're what... fascinating by something that's not horse related yeah, exactly that's all we do is horse crap <laughs> so what yeah. is different about a traditional running shoe and a trail running shoe which i think is where helena was going with that what, what's 
What's different? Uh, it's mostly uh, they're grippier and they tend to be waterproof because you sometimes have to run through puddles or little streams and stuff like that. So they tend to be waterproof. Not all of them are, and they tend to be grippier on the bottom. It's funny because I, I've so. been looking at a lot of hiking lately, and we're thinking about doing a Colorado uh, a hike for f- five days in the in the Rockies uh-huh. next year. And everybody, you know, it used to be hiking boots. Everybody wore boots, right? The over-the-ankle yep. boots, the big tough boots. And now everybody's gone with the hiking sneakers. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it seems to be, and they look a lot like the shoes you're talking about, the trail runners, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Waterproof. And- yeah, and I do I do a little bit of road running too just cuz you can't make it out to the trails every single day, but so I have some some pretty versatile shoes that that will handle both. Okay, so, so. make us all sick and really make us depressed by telling us, uh, you know, if the weather's <laughs> nice, how much do you run a day? Do you run every day? I run just about every day. So I I tend I try to get between 20 and 30 miles a week, and so I'll do um, like four shorter runs, anywhere between three and five miles. And then one longer run where I'm gearing up towards the distance of my next race. And so right now my long runs are between 12 and 13 miles and, um, <laughs> working up to my next race is 15 miles. So I'd like to be at 17 miles for my long runs before. Have before I ever race. told you I hate you, Biz? <laughs> 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 So how do you how right? do you compare oh, yeah, your running life to your horse life? I mean, what do you what do you get out of running? Nation, you... uh, I'm writing an article on that right now, so if it should be up on Horse Nation, uh, hopefully sometime next week. So maybe look into that. But I'd say the main thing is I get a lot of discipline, and the the discipline of you know really committing to a training program carries over into my riding life, and really committing to a training program with my horses. Um, that that mental discipline is huge, I think, for riding. Uh, if you have you know big competitive goals, especially. So, so are you though? So I'm guessing then that because you immerse so much of yourself into what you're doing, because that discipline mm-hmm. applies both you know emotionally and intellectually in, in your hobbies or your activities. That what you wear on your body, your gear is really important, and it has to perform, and it has to be comfortable. So if oh, we kind of bring definitely. Right. And when it doesn't, it's yes. so distracting. So in that context, let's take it back to the boots. And, sure. um, you know, just that was really from good, everything... Helena, by the way, that transition. <laughs> I know. Was, great segue. That was good That's segue. why you pay me the big bucks. <laughs> so, um, although I don't have a pair of these boots, just saying. Um, so you, you, you get them on your feet there. Um, there's so far, everything is good. You put your foot in the stirrup and you throw your leg over What's the first thing you yep. think of when you, you've got these boots on brand new, because you know what? I'm sorry, yeah. but when we put them on, first impressions are important. What are you thinking brand new first time riding in them? So I, you know, my favorite part about riding in them is that I didn't realize I was riding in new boots. They felt like a part of me. I like everything, you know, kind of close contact with my horse. All of my saddles are more close contact type saddles. And I feel like this boot, um, since it's so right off the bat, so soft and supple, gives you that really close contact feel with your horse's side. You don't feel like you're having to, you know, work through your boot, which a lot of other new boots I know, you know, for the first couple of weeks, you feel like you're having to work against them instead of just having them be there for your leg. Um, and these, I did not feel like that. I felt like right away I could feel my horse's side and I could use my leg how I wanted to. And um, they were super flexible through the ankle right off the bat, which is huge. Um, and I just felt like, you know, they provide protection without being restrictive Mm, because that's really hard to that anything that makes you feel restricted in the saddle is oh yeah you just forget it you might as well just get off and walk (laughs) exactly exactly and especially you know when you have horses that are a little bit more on the sensitive side if you have a boot that makes you feel like you need to use your leg more (laughs) they're not going to be too pleased about that Exactly. I repeat, then you might as well just get off and walk. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or the horse will yeah. make that decision for you. Uh, yeah. I just found them to be, you know, great to ride in right away instead of having that, you know, one to two week break in period. So we always ask if you that found a negative. Um, not yet, honestly. <laughs> These are pretty great boots. And one thing I want to comment on is what they look like. They're absolutely gorgeous. Um, they have this really cool little patent leather 
strip. That's kind of like the integral integral sign. You know, if you've taken calculus, it's in that shape, but it's really flattering towards your, to your leg and the shape of your leg. And I've also found that sometimes boots that are made out of this softer leather don't polish up that nicely. And these actually get super shiny when you polish them. So that's nice to know uh, with for show season that they do get really nice and shiny. So and it, here, did you get the brown or the black? I got the black. Yeah, the brown actually has has black on it. They're kind of black mm-hmm. and brown, and they're really sharp. Looking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. seen those, yeah. There really are. Well, this is good. That's a good review. And they're $350 at Horse Lovers Now, marked down from 389 You can find them. They come in a multitude of sizes. There's a size chart on there uh, from from tiny to, to all the way up to 10s and 11s in women. So you can find it in black and brown. And uh, all the other details are on the website at horselovers.com. It's the Mountain Horse Lady Sovereign Field boot thanks a bunch biz yeah no problem so what's going on in the world of newport and that newport show well buck and i spent a better part of the quiet holiday planning our 2017 editorial calendar we're like grown-ups we have an editorial well, we calendar. haven't done that in eight years for this show why should you start <laughs> Because, I don't know, it's harder to talk about things that are not horses than it is to talk about horses. <laughs> Jeez, uh, you're making us look a bad, lot of, <laughs> Well, there's, there's a lot of, you know, like I can just sit down in my chair on any given day and be like, hmm, I want to talk about hooves today. Or, hmm, I want to talk about grooming or jumping. But, you know, when you're not talking about horses, you have to think ahead of time. So we, we spent our time planning and um, we're there's actually a lot of, a lot of fun stuff. We're actually going to be covering a bridal expo in uh, February. That isn't a horse bridal. That is a, a, bri- a, a bridesmaid bridegroom bridal expo. It's everything from food to cake to venues. Okay, to, so yeah, it's not well, leather bridles. Know, it's uh, the the getting no, married. No, it's type. wedding stuff. Yes, yes, it's wedding stuff. So, but you know me, I'll find a way to work horses into that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a bridal expo in Newport. Is that the deal? It's in Newport. So one of the mansions is available for weddings, for venues. It's called Rosecliff, and it's oh, absolutely beautiful. Yeah. yeah. The Great Gatsby was filmed there. A bunch of other movies were filmed there. So it's just, it's beautiful. So one of, so the, the wedding expo is going to be split into two venues, Rosecliff, and then one on the other side of the island called Ocean Cliff. Both, of course, have ocean views. So either way, I get to spend the day looking at frilly, fluffy things with ocean views and good food and people who are generally in a good mood because they're getting married. And that's going to kick off the 2017 thing. We're so much. We're going to have a whole horse month. We're going to cover polo. We're going to cover they do that in Newport. Yep. Yeah. They have a really great team, really strong polo program here. And we're going to do the Jazz Festival, which is a big, big deal. Newport Jazz Festival. And uh, do they a couple still of other the things. the Italian Festival? It's small. It's they small? do have it, yes, okay. but it's small. Because I remember yep. when we went to that, it was packed with people. It was so busy. Um, yeah, it that's it's, it's more of a sailing, you know, historical thing. The Italians don't. You know, they they fly under the radar here in New England. So now, wasn't Rosecliff the one that we went to together? Yes, okay, that we took a tour. They had of. the big yeah. ballroom there. Yep, yep. Now they I have remember. the big bar. That was the one where I was trying to open the closet door yes. to see what was. <laughs> I'm getting in trouble. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, see, it's in the closet. I did. Don't touch. <laughs> Every time we go on a mansion tour, I'm sneaking in some back staircase, <laughs> try, trying all the doors and closets, and I found some that were unlocked. <laughs> I got to peek in and get Helena's own private tour. So these are the kinds of things. Obviously, we're going to be covering all the stuff that that's fun for tourists and residents in Newport. But Helena's going to be getting into a little bit of trouble. So we're going to feature that, too. Terrific. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Very good. Trouble is fun. Buck has been a good influence on you getting organized <laughs> and everything. I'm impressed. Buck, Yeah. <laughs> I've been a bad influence for almost nine years. And now Buck comes along and straightens you out. Strains me out. He's the one who introduced me to tequila. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah. by the way, tequila is uh, apparently gluten free and uh, uh, yep, yeah, and good for you. You know. Well, you know, I joke all the time, and and we the way you we we talk on this show and on that Newport show, you would think that we were a couple of booze hounds. Yeah. But really, I I can't 
hold my alcohol. I don't like to get drunk. I, I don't. And that's part of the reason why I can't drink a lot of wine. Like I'll have a really good glass of wine with dinner. But if we go out someplace, it's just not my gig. However, if I do get a quality tequila that I can sip, it's absolutely delicious. And yes, it does give you a little bit of that warm and fuzzy. It takes the edge off. But because it doesn't have sugar in it, it doesn't make you feel you don't get a headache. Um, obviously, if you drink too much of anything, you're going to get a hangover. But it's a little bit easier on the body, I think, but than most other alcohols. there is a line with tequila where you go from okay to dancing on the table. There's that line with tequila. Honestly, that's if you shoot it. And I don't shoot. And I don't think any... I, I'm not a fan of shooting any kind of booze. I think it's stupid. The only point of doing shots is to get drunk. Right, right. It's just... Or if you can't really... You want to take that edge off, but you don't like drinking alcohol. Well, here's here's a newsflash. If you don't like drinking alcohol, don't drink alcohol. Which is why we Shooting. don't drink a lot. Because I, I never right. like the taste of alcohol that much, except for super sweet drinks, which I'm not allowed to have anymore. No more strawberry daiquiris for me. Those, I'll have the occasional strawberry daiquiri. I, I do, I'll dabble in some other things. Like, I love a dirty vodka martini. But that's pretty much because I like olives. So that's just essentially <laughs> olives and olive juice with a little vodka thrown yeah, in. That's right. You might as well you just know, drink out of the jar. <laughs> yeah. So Buck has introduced me to the joys of alcohol. But I, I am an adult and I do drink responsibly. And it's nice. You know, it's that's one of the benefits of moderation is that you get to enjoy a lot more things if you're not overindulging. Well, that you can find all of that uh, boozing going on over at that <laughs> That's true. Newportshow.com. Well, that's it for today's show. Uh, we're out of here. You can find all of the details about today's show at stablescoop.com. Before we go, though, I do have a couple of announcements to make about the Horse Radio Network real quick. One is that the horses in the morning show, we were doing a weekend episodes that were done by the Plaid Horse magazine. They have now broken off to become their own show this month. So it's the, called the Plaid Cast, and it, it's all about the Hunter Jumper world. Awesome. So they will be covering everything Hunter Jumper. That's their world. That's what the Plaid Horse Magazine covers. So they have their own weekly show starting this week. You can look Finally. for that. Finally. It'll be showing. Finally, we yep. get the Hunter Jumper. I know. It's been an area that we've been lacking for sure. Uh, and that'll be showing up in our app over the next couple of weeks and also on iTunes and everything. And we'll keep you informed of that. But it will be on the horseradionetwork.com website. You can find that there until we get the idea. Helena knows what a hassle to get all that set up is. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll be doing that. Uh, another announcement is that the driving radio show will be going to twice a month instead of weekly. So we're going to be cutting back on that a little bit. Uh, Wendy, Dr. Wendy has a lot going on right now, and we thought it would be better to do that uh, to accommodate her schedule. And some of that we'll be able to announce soon, too, what's happening there. And then the other thing uh, that's happening is another new show that we're very excited about is Samantha Clark is back. And Yay! the World Equestrian Games show is starting this month. It'll be twice a month through the World Equestrian Games in 2018 in Tryon, North Carolina. During the games, we'll be doing a daily show all 14 days like we did back in 2010 in Lexington. Samantha, for those that weren't around, and most of you weren't, Samantha was my co-host back then. Everybody loves Samantha's uh, lovely British accent. So she'll be joining me. And it's and, her also her lovely demeanor. She's a she's a good podcaster and yes. she's a nice person. I always thought I I uh, I am the not so sweet part of that combination. That's for sure. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, she, she's the good cop. You're yeah, totally a bad cop. Exactly. Guy. But we have fun doing the show together. We had a blast doing the WEG show the last time. It's called the 2018 WEG show. So we're going to be coming out with that next week. That'll also be showing up on the feeds, and we'll let get you more information about that as we get the first one recorded. We're going to be covering all things WEG, from competitors to how it all works. We're, we're going to give a lot of information for new people that don't understand what the WEG is, have never followed it before. We had a lot of people like that on the last show, and we really do explain all seven of the sports and how they work and what the rules are. We try and keep it basic, but then we also talk to competitors and talk to the organizers. We'll be covering everything from where to stay to where to eat, 
a little bit of everything about the WEG. So that will be coming up this month as well. So lots of new stuff. You can find all of the details about the Stable Scoop show at stablescoop.com or on our app, iOS or Android. Just search for Horse Radio Network. Are you waiting for me or are you yes, done? Because you're just on a roll. You. I was just... <laughs> I think that's about it anyway. Sometimes you just roll with it. And I, I'm like, all right, he's we going. We want to thank our this. sponsors, horselovers.com. And don't forget <laughs> the Fairfield in North in Lexington, Kentucky. If you're heading to Road to the Horse or if you're heading to Rolex this year. All right, Helena, that's it. Let's go. Oh, day. good. Good. Well, at least we'll have some more for you guys next week. Until then, happy scooping and thanks for joining us.